extremely important from a clinical perspective about what's happening in terms of Turner syndrome. And we're going to talk about the entirety of the disease, starting from genetics to clinical parameters, how we have had changes in terms of pathophysiology, evaluation, assessment and management. And this is one condition which is very common, but unfortunately, there are a lot of issues which cause confusions in that regards. You can have a look at our website, Learning Learning.org Society, which has got a lot of information about that. This webinar will also be posted there in the webinar section. So you can go and have a look subsequently on individual videos. From there, you can have a look at our masterclass in pediatric endocrinology, which covers the entirety of pediatric endocrinology, now approximately 100 modules, using a number of factors. You've got a postgraduate course also, which is a three-year course for postgraduates. And we've got the books which are available, the MediClasses books. And just this week, we have published the Indian Journal of Pediatrics, Practical Pediatric Endocrinology Group, which is a book which is basically there for uh, guidance with regards to specific management on 30 pediatric endocrine disorders. <coughs> and there's a MediClasses application available on endocrinology and pediatrics, both in the iOS and Android, which provides very easy way of assessing and managing these disorders. So eye Turner syndrome would be a program which will basically try to cover a number of factors. We'll start off with the basics, basically how the genetics works, how we evaluate and how it has implications. Then Dr. Prateek will talk about pointers and criteria, followed by a bit of assessment, which Naveen will carry forward. Then I'll talk a bit again about growth hormone and cardiac issue, then Dr. Sain will discuss about what's latest with regards to puberty. And then we have got a big number of cases which will really help us interact. What we'll do now is that we'll go back to the very basics because genetics is the crux of it. Because all the things that we're talking about, the manifestation, the treatment, ultimately have a genetic basis. So we need to understand how all these things happen. So if you look at the chromosomes and you look at the karyotype, which all of us have done many times, there is, of course, a difference between a normal male and a normal female karyotype. And the basic difference is 2X versus XY. Now, if you see just the pictorial representation, you see that the X is much more heavier than the Y. So women are carrying a lot more burden than men, even from a karyotype perspective, if you look at it. So there are, therefore, in a way, there are a number of genes which may be double in the woman as compared to men. So what's going to happen? How are you going to balance that out? And that becomes important. We know how a single gene can cause a huge problem. If you have so much more genetic material, what really happens becomes important. So there is a discrepancy between the two. There are double doses of genes. And therefore, there is a need to balance to allow this far come. And this balancing process is long known as the process of lionization in which the sections which are there in the X chromosome, which are not in the Y chromosome, are inactivated. So if you look at a typical chromosome, the X chromosome has got a long arm, the XQ, which is basically then linked by a centromere to the short arm, the petit arm, the P arm, and the Y chromosome is much smaller. So there are some regions in the X chromosome which are equivalent to the Y chromosome, and this is what we call as the pseudo-autosomal region. There are, on the other hand, regions which are not common. So there would be a risk of having double amount of genes for those regions, and that's why they are inactivated. And this inactivation trait is basically controlled by a, a small group of genes, which are themselves there in the X chromosome, which are known as XIS, <laughs> or the X inactivating site, which will basically destroy all or inactivate or imprint all the genes which are there in the X, but not on the Y. What it basically means is that there will be some regions which are shared and common to these, which behave like a autosomal genes. So while we're talking about sex chromosomes, there are also the pseudo autosomal region, which behaves like the autosomal gene. And these genes are basically responsible for manifestation of Turner syndrome. So essentially what we're trying to say is that Turner syndrome represents the deficient action of the particular gene which is deleted, which is in the pseudo-autosomal region. Now there is a pseudo-autosomal region, uh, one which is very, very significant. It is on the end of the chromosomes, both X and Y. And this actually has got a number of important genes, the most important from the growth and the skeletal perspective is the shock gene. Now this shock gene, 
<coughs> is responsible for growth and in turner syndrome you will have only single expression of shocks and this is what causes growth failure now what are the conditions in which you have got multiple shocks expressions sign <coughs> So if you have Klinefelter, you will have three, but again, you will have lionization. So it will not have that much. Other condition, Pratik? So if you have X, Y, Y, there is no lionization, you will have three shocks. So they will be the tallest individuals there. So in a way, you can think of as a dose response. If you have got two shocks, you've got an average height. If you've got one shock, which will go basically towards the possibility of a... Uh, basically, a Turner syndrome, the growth will be compromised. While if you have got uh, uh, multiple shocks, you will be taught. So this is like a dose response, which is there. And shocks is not only responsible for growth, it is also responsible for other skeletal manifestations like brachymetacarpia, like uh, the mad lung deformity. And it has now been shown that individuals who have got very quote unquote idiopathic short stature a number of them may actually have a shock gene defect. And secondarily, you have a, a genetic syndrome, which is known as the Larry wheel chondrodysostosis, in which you basically will have a shock defect. So shocks is an important gene because it's a contiguous gene deletion. The shocks will be affected in Turner syndrome. The second, of course, in that regards is the BMP15, which plays a very important role. Of course, when we talked about the ovarian development, the bone morphogenic protein, play the important role in the ovarian development. We have got the TIMP region, which is important for cardiac development. So now you can really understand when we say syndrome and all those findings were described of short stature, ovarian problem, cardiac problem, they were when the genetic diagnosis was not there. Now what you can understand that everybody, every turner will not behave the same. Some may have the whole X chromosome, which is gone in some, PAR1, some gene will go, in some multiple genes will go. So the manifestations, therefore, have to be heterogeneous depending upon how much the manifestations are. But if you talk about the classical presentation, it's basically this PAR1, which is responsible for this classical presentation. The second gene, which is the PAR2, it's actually on the Q arm. So this was in the short arm, and this is in the long arm. And here you have got specific genes which are there, the most important is the fragile X-related mutation. And these are responsible basically for some of the ovarian functions. So if a girl has got a deletion in the PAR2 region, the major manifestation will basically be in the form of an ovarian problem. You may not have that shock defect. You may not have the cardiac defect. You may not have the other lymphedema and all those things happening. It's basically a problem which is happening at the level of the ovarian. So very distal defects in the XQ region are considered to be a premature ovarian failure rather than Turner syndrome. <clears throat> because if you label somebody as Turner syndrome, it has implications in terms of monitoring, cardiac, all those issues come up in that regards. So depending upon which region is affected, the manifestations will present like that in that perspective. There's also a lymphedema region, which is not very clear, which basically causes the lymph development. And if you have that affected, there'll be lymphedema, which will cause cardiac problems, which will cause renal problem, which will cause your webbing of neck. And all those problems will come up from that in that perspective. Now, in this situation, if we now look at essentially what's happening in <coughs> Turner syndrome is that you've got one X chromosome, which is intact. The other X chromosome either completely or partially is inactivated. The genes in that are not working in that situation. There could be a situation wherein the chromosome may be disrupted and then it will rejoin as a ring chromosome. So these are the all manifestations which we'll discuss subsequently and that will determine the type of manifestations that are there in this situation. And if you have a ring chromosome, particularly affecting the XIST region, there will be issues of development, syndactyly, there will be much more syndromic effects which are there. So they are beyond Turner syndrome in that perspective. So we need to be aware about the genotype, phenotype association. And often when we read the karyotype report, we get confused. So we need to understand what exactly does this karyotype mean because they will have significant implications in terms of diagnosis, assessment, and management in that regard. 
<coughs> so therefore, different parts will have different regions. So just to explain that, we knew that Shock's gene is the major one which regulates growth. Abnormality in Shock's causes short stature and maxillary deformity. BMP15 is more like an ovarian gene. TIMP are basically for the cardiac development. FMR1 are more for ovarian. Again, deficiency there would call only ovarian failure with no other abnormality. And then we have got the lymphedema region. So these are more like a genetic defect. Now it becomes easier to understand rather than just saying the Turner will have so many manifestations from that perspective. <coughs> and as I said, the XIST is the one which causes inactivation. So if you are not able to inactivate, you will have double dose of so many other sex chromosome genes. And there you will have mental developmental issues, syndactyly, and other abnormalities which will happen in that situation. So now the genetic spectrum of Turner syndrome is basically, you have got an intact X chromosome and the other chromosome may be completely gone. This is what is known as the classical Turner syndrome, which will have the most severe manifestation. All these genes are gone. Second situation which will happen is that you basically have got duplication of the P arm. So you've got P and Q, your Q goes off and the P becomes W. So essentially you are losing that PAR1 region, which is the most important part. So this is known as a iso -XQ. This is a very, very common manifestation. The manifestation will be similar to a classical turner because you'll have cardiac, ovarian and growth issue. But probably because the FMR1 region is there, your ovarian effects may not be that significant. They do have a propensity of an autoimmune thyroid disorder, which is more common in this setting in that regard. The other situation which may happen is that you may have just a distant deletion of P. Again, these two will behave like similar fashions. So this is a deletion of the P chromosome. You may have a distal deletion of the X chromosome. Q, Q arm, which again will present more like an ovarian failure rather than more of a other classical turners in that regard. You can have a ring in which the part of the P and Q are mixed up and you will have a problem. And if it is affecting the XIST region, as I said, you will have a lot of these mental retardation, bacchidectally, syndactyly, all these abnormalities can happen. And of course, there could be an issue in which you have got an additional Y line. And this is a big risk factor. If you have Turner syndrome with a Y cell line, there would be a significant risk of malignancy. So this should be considered if you have an obvious Y line, which is there on your chromosome, maybe around 7-8% may have that. Or if you have a marker chromosome. So marker chromosome is a chromosome you don't know. It's coming from X or Y. Or if there is virilization, which happens during puberty. So you don't need to do a Y line in everybody. <clears throat> it's not required, but it is required if you have a marker chromosome or if you have got this virilization which happens during puberty, which becomes significant from that perspective. So most common still is classical form. Many people debate that the classical form cannot survive. No other monosomy survives. So how they are surviving? Maybe there is some mosaicism in specific tissues. Maybe there, there are some cell lines which are still which you are not detecting on your blood test or that modacism is going off with age and that's why you are missing out. So this is a debate. But if you talk about from clinical perspective, 45% of all your cases would actually be X0 and they will be the more classical. But you can have very mild manifestations with the other. So just to just recapitulate, the classic form, your whole X chromosome is not there. The manifestations will have... Uh, Big in terms of classic presentation, height will be like 20 centimeters below. They will be premature. There will not be any pubertal development at all. And growth failure in all the aspects will be there in this situation. The mosaicism is the other situation wherein you have a post-zygotic error. So some of them will have a complete classic X0. Some will have X chromosome. So this, of course, is a dose effect. So the number and the distribution of the mosaicism will decide which way the girl will manifest. So classically, these mosaic forms will have a milder presentation than the classical form. So essentially what will happen here is that the supposed zygotic defect and manifestations will cause more survival and higher growth as compared to the other individuals. So it's again because let's say you had got one shocks, normal has two shocks, 
If there is a 50% modasism, you have got 1.5 shocks. And that 1.5, it is more towards the growth plate. You may have complete shocks. So it depends upon when that mutation happens and which way they are expressed. So that's why the manifestations will be different. And often these are the girls who will present to you with spontaneous breast development, spontaneous menarche, and rarely they will have pregnancy as well. So the, it's not just the severity of the defect, it's also the extent, how many cells are affected will be important. So always look at the mosaicism part, which will give you the clue in that regards. Isochromosome Q is essentially a deletion of the P arm. So they will behave like a P deletion in which in that perspective, as I discussed, so essentially what you are seeing is that these will present more like a classical form because P is the more important. So when we say typically diagnosis of Turner syndrome, usually a part of P becomes important. Otherwise the manifestation may just be ovarian failure and you don't label them classically as a Turner syndrome. So they behave like classic form. Often there is mosaicism with X or XX so the manifestation may be milder. They have a greater prevalence of a thyroid disorder which is more common in this city. Then <coughs> XP deletion would basically be the part of the P chromosome may be deleted. And again, the manifestations would basically be depending upon how much it is deleted. So if you have a PR effect, you will have short stature, you will have cardiac effect, you have uh, effect on the ovarian function as well. So effectively, it is more of the severe defects in that regards. Now, this is interesting. <coughs> if you have an XQ deletion, you may actually escape most of the effects which are there in Turner syndrome. So these patients basically will have deletion of XQ and manifestations over in failure is more prominent because this is the fragile X premutation site. This will be, if it's distal to XQ24, you won't even label it as Turner syndrome. You will say it's more like a, this is what uh, Praveen uh, Naveen will talk about that and we'll go from there. Now, very importantly, you need to identify the ring chromosome where the abnormality is that the whole chromosome is basically cut and it forms a ring in that situation. And this presentation is very unusual because it will present basically more with features of mental retardation along with severity of skeletal dysplasia and growth failure. So again, this is distinct from the Turner syndrome if the XIST region is affected in that situation. Now, of course, Y cell line, which is an additional Y cell line, as I said, is present in around 10% cases in both covert and overt. All the guidelines for gonadectomy are based upon conventional karyotype. So you do not need to <coughs> do an extensive search of the Y cell line because we don't know what happens if you do a routine detection, what that Y means. But if you find it on conventional karyotype, if there is a marker chromosome, or if there is virilization, you have to really bother about that in terms of Turner syndrome. And manifestations basically is, of course, gonadoblastoma risk, which is an important factor. And if there is virilization, which means that there is a testicular tissue basically, which is present there. And gonadotomy is required. So what really is a marker chromosome? Marker chromosome is basically a chromosome which you don't uh, classify as X or Y. So this looks like a small patch of chromosome which is lying there. You don't know whether it's X or Y. This is a risk factor. If there is a marker chromosome, you have to consider a Y cell line slash gonadectomy subsequently because this is a risk factor. You don't know whether it's X or Y in that situation. So essentially, you have to go by a Y material that becomes very, very important in a marker chromosome. And there is a gonadoblastoma risk, which is there. So now if I just summarize these findings, the classical karyotype is 45% cases, most severe, and you have to really be concerned about that. If there is a mosaicism, the manifestation is same, but milder. If it's mainly a triple X mosaicism, that will become even rarer. The manifestation will become milder. So you will have triple X will give you more shots. So you will have more tall there, while the shock deficiency here will compensate for the height. Then if you have isochromosome Q, it's like an XP deletion, more thyroiditis, which is there. If it's a ring chromosome, more of a mental abnormality, more of syndactyly or the manifestations, and Q deletion, more of a ovarian insufficiency, I'll be discussed. And of course, marker chromosome risk of malignancy will be there. So now we've discussed about the various genes which are affected. 
we need to understand why all these manifestations happen so there are three cardinal things you have to worry about turner syndrome growth puberty and cardiac failure so we'll talk about what's the basis of their problems so growth is really affected in turner syndrome and a lot of it is because of shocks on an average if you lose a dose of shocks how much height is decreased now again there will be on 20 cm <laughs> yeah. so 20 to 25 is the entire turner height loss but i would say if you say shocks it's like 10 to 50 because if you talk about climb fenter they are 10 to 15 more climb fenter is a complicated thing if you go by x y y that is definitely 50 So one shocks probably means around 10 to 15 centimeter loss, which is there. Along with the shocks effect, there is a growth plate defect, which is intrinsic there. There is skeletal dysplasia, which may affect. There will be estrogen deficiency, which happens, and of course the puberty growth spurt is not there. So while the growth hormone levels are normal in Turner syndrome, you have got multiple other factors which are affected. But that does not mean that if you increase growth hormone levels beyond the physiological range there will be no response there will be response but it will not be equivalent to a growth hormone deficiency response and this is what i will be taking up later on so growth is affected but your gh igf1 axis will be normal so you don't need to really do a gh igf axis evaluation if you have a short curve with turner syndrome you exclude celiac you exclude thyroid you exclude systemic illness go for growth hormone therapy in that situation which is important what about bones so bones are also affected and there are multiple factors which affect the bone health the most important of course is the estrogen deficiency so if you have less estrogen your rank ligand will be more your osteoclast will start acting more and therefore you will have a low bone mass which happens in this situation and that of course will have a impact on the other aspects as well there is a direct skeletal effect so overall they will have a lower mass but because the size is less you will disproportionately overestimate the severity of bone abnormalities in the setting of turner syndrome so you have to be careful about that and that's why we say do not do a dexa routinely unless you have completed your estrogen replacement because if you not completed your estrogen replacement one they have not reached the peak bone mass which will cause a confusion the bone size will be less which will be a cause of confusion but yes bmd is decreased but if you give proper growth hormone if you give proper estrogen you will have a normal sort of a bone density in that situation the other thing of course is that vitamin d plays a role there is a risk of increased fracture because they have more in coordination because turner patients tend to fall more they are a bit having difficulty in a visio spatial manner so they tend to fall more the cortical deficit is there and the thickness of the bones are less so the bones are not only light they are less thick in the edges so they are easier to break so you have to be careful about that in that perspective but the treatment is mainly estrogen you don't start a bisphosphonate unless and until you have given enough estrogen and despite that there is a fragility fracture because the problem is estrogen problem is not offer increased resorption for any other thing so estrogen is the best anti resorptive agent you can think of in that situation ovaries what do you think what happens to the ovaries is it a ovarian dysgenesis sign is turner syndrome a ovarian dysgenesis sir the formation is okay yes. but uh, it uh, leads to early failure yes so a very very important thing to remember is that people say that this is ovarian streak gonads ovarian dysgenesis no the ovaries are perfectly normally tough formed they behave like normal ovaries but what is happening here is that they tend to have a earlier atresia which happens attrition so even in normal situation girls will lose 90% of their ovarian follicles by the time they are born sort of millions of them the numbers will be less by the time they enter puberty the numbers will be very very high so what happens in turn is that the same thing is accelerated so you will have a rapid decline in terms of ovarian function but it's not a dysgenesis in that situation so <clears throat> what you see here is that lot of the girl will actually have lost their ovarian function by the time the girl presents to you in turn us this is shifted to the left so even at birth the follicular numbers will be very less now of course 
the more the FRM you are expressing, the more BMP you are expressing, the ovaries may be preserved. If there is a mosaic form, it may be preserved. If it's affecting just one part of the X chromosome, it may be preserved. So, although classic Turner <laughs> would rarely enter puberty, a reasonable number of girls with Turner syndrome who are non-classic mosaic will actually enter puberty, which you have to be wary about in that regards. And if there is a mosaic form, if the AMH level is detectable, if the FSH is not high, it is suggested that there is a chance of having a normal pubertal development which may happen in that situation. Last, very important, so we've talked about growth, we've talked about uh, the pubertal aspect. The next very important is, of course, the risk of malignancy. So if there is a vice cell line, <coughs> essentially what it is doing is that it is producing certain areas which are differentiating into testes. So maybe that particular gonad has got some testicular tissue. This is a very, very crude way of understanding, but this is what is happening essentially. And this will have a risk of developing malignancy subsequently. And this is something you have to be concerned about in that regard. So there is a risk of virilization, which will happen. The gonad may get converted into gonadoblastoma, which is basically a benign condition. But this gonadoblastoma has a high risk of developing germinomas, which uh, Pratik had talked a lot about the IDST talk when we discussed about that. So 10 to 30 percent risk of gonadoblastoma is there. And then you develop this germinoma. So this is something which you have to be careful about. And therefore, prophylactic gonadectomy is recommended. So as we discussed, Turner syndrome affects the skeleton in everybody. All girls will be shot. Ovaries in a good number of cases. Cardiac, again, very common. We'll talk about all these individual things later on. Renal abnormalities, again, because of uh, edema. So whatever the fetal edema is there, the kidneys cannot come up. So if kidneys cannot come up, they have a horseshoe kidney. So all these are more of a mechanical problem, which is there. Then hearing because of the structure. So the way the ear tubes are made, they are more prone to infection. And then they develop sensory neural hearing loss later on. There could be a problem of the liver, and this may be the hepatic or even the intestinal function may be affected, 30 to 40%, and then eyes, ears, autoimmunity.